Good morning. I'm Reverend Phyllis Barron, and I am so glad that you're here worshiping with us today. And we thank our quartet that just played for us. They were fantastic. They perform, uh, they formed their group in 2017, and they also formed the University of Wisconsin Symphony Orchestra. So we are so delighted they're here uh, giving us a beautiful blessing this morning. Now, on next uh, Sunday, on July 15th at 12.15, I invite you to the informational meeting on the trip to Germany. It's a, the Passion Play is what it's really all about, is when they suffered the plague back in the 1600s, and they made a promise and a vow to God that if they were spared, they would perform the Passion Play every 10 years. So that's why the trip is scheduled for 2020. They've been doing this for over 400 years. So I hope that you can join me for that information informational meeting in Wesley Hall next week. And this week, starting tomorrow, is Vacation Bible School. And we have over 600 children coming. And I don't know how many adults, probably three or 400. I don't know, Mark's raising his hands up over there. And so I said it at 9.30 and they took it the wrong way because I asked for prayers for it, but it's not because it won't be fantastic. I just want us to uphold it in prayer and make it a joyful and a wonderful celebration this week. And we are so excited about Vacation Bible School. So now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Would you please stand now for our call to worship? This place for us is holy ground, a sacred community. This sacred place calls us to be still and know God's presence. In this sacred place, God disarms the barriers we have placed around us. Let us honor this sacred place and our sacred calling.
like to remain standing as we affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and to serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was taking care of the flock for his father-in-law Jethro, Midian's priest. He led his flock out to the edge of the desert, and he came to God's mountain called Horeb. The Lord's messenger appeared to him in a flame of fire in the, mi in the middle of a bush. Moses saw that the bush was in flames, but it didn't burn up. Then Moses said to himself, let me check out this amazing sight and find out why the bush isn't burning up. When the Lord saw that he was coming to look, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, I'm here. Then the Lord said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I've clearly seen my people oppressed in Egypt. I've heard their cry of injustice because of their slave masters. I know about their pain. I've come down to rescue them from the Egyptians in order to take them out of that land and bring them to a good and broad land, a land that is full of milk and honey, a place where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites all live. Now the Israelites' cries of injustice have reached me. I've seen just how much the Egyptians have oppressed them, so get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll be with you, and this will show you that I'm the one who sent you. After you bring the people out of Egypt, you will come back here and worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I now come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they are going to ask me, what's this God's name? What am I supposed to say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. So say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how all generations will remember me. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
like to invite the children to come down for our time together. Kids, come on. So we heard uh, Reverend Casey read a really important part of the story. It's about Moses, the Ten Commandments guy, that guy, Moses. And this is before the Ten Commandments. And he is out keeping watch over his flocks because he's being a shepherd. Let's all pretend like we're watching over our flocks. We're trying to make sure there's no wolves or leopards or lions come around. And then he sees a burning bush. But he doesn't just go, huh. This is the desert. There's a burning bush over there. That's a very common thing to see and go about his business. What he does is he wants to go check it out. But it's not until he goes to check it out that he then hears the voice of God. God didn't say, Moses, Moses. Moses actually has to go and check out the burning bush. And then when he gets there, Moses tells him to take his sandals off of his feet because the place where he is standing is holy ground. But you know, even, even though God was there before Moses got there, I wonder if it was holy ground yet. I mean, any place, God's everywhere, so maybe everywhere is holy ground. But that's not really what holy means. Holy means special. Holy means set apart for a special purpose. So even though God's everywhere, I wonder if that means every place is holy ground, or maybe it means every place can be holy ground if we respond when God calls. Because once again, Moses didn't just hear God's call. Moses had to go. Moses had to walk. Moses had to go check out that bush. Because really, when you think about it, if a bush burns in the wilderness and no one goes to check it out, is it really holy ground? We don't know yet. But Moses heard the call, and I bet that's when God said, yep, that one. That's my guy right there. But not every place is holy ground. Let's explore some regular ground kinds of places. I got my friend Ellie. Everybody say hi to Ellie. Ellie is going to reenact something from my childhood, which is way too painful for me to reenact myself. Here comes the first pitch. Get the bat ready. And boom, strike one. And boom, strike two. And get the bat up. Yeah, you're trying really hard. And boom, strike three. And the walk of shame back to the dugout. You know, when I played baseball, I was never afraid of getting hit by the ball because that meant I got to go to first base. And since I was such a bad batter, I didn't care. <laughs> but I was terrified of striking out. And the worst one was when it was in the bottom of the last inning and we were behind and it was my turn to go to the plate, and there were two outs. I mean, I would already be doing the math in the dugout, okay, please don't be at me, and it'd be my turn, and then strike three, the last out of the game, and she feels awful. I felt awful. Well, that's not holy ground. That's regular ground. That was really regular ground for me growing up, but we could have made, that could have been holy ground. If just one person, maybe even someone from the other team, had come up after the game and not just done good game, good game, good game, good game, but said, hey, I've struck out too. I know just how that feels. It's going to be okay. Because really, it needs to be someone from the other team because sometimes the people from my own team were the last ones who wanted to tell me it was going to be okay, right? But that would, I, what I would have given for one person to come tell me that it's going to be okay, that it's not the worst thing in the world that I struck out, that Babe Ruth struck out all the time. That would have taken regular ground and make it holy ground. Let's do another one with regular ground. Let's imagine there's some trash. I just happened to bring some trash. Now, there's trash on the ground. That's regular ground. We see that, right? Have you ever seen trash on the ground, on the side of the road, in a park, walking along the Trinity River? And if we make a mess and we pick up our own mess, we're being nice. But that's still a pretty regular ground thing to do, right? We're supposed to pick up after ourselves. But what if, what if, go ahead, what if you decide to take the initiative 
and pick up trash even though you didn't make the mess. And while it's like, hey, that's not fair. Someone else made the mess. They should come up and pick up the trash. Well, that's a regular ground thing. But when we want to take our little part of the world and make it better and be willing to put in a little bit of extra work even though we're not the ones who made the mess, that's taking regular ground and making it holy ground. That's taking something that was regular and setting it apart for something special. Ellie, I'm going to take them. Is this microphone working? Will this work if I pick up this microphone? And I talk into it like this. Oh, yeah, it works. Ellie was talking to me before we were preparing for this. We actually practiced for this. She practiced a lot. I practiced a little. Um, about a situation like in your own school where there was a regular ground situation. What was that regular ground situation? Um, someone got blamed for something that they didn't do. That's a pretty regular... Have you ever, anybody been blamed for something they didn't do? Does that ever happen? That's pretty... Anybody in the grown-ups? Right? That is really regular ground stuff. What would have made that holy ground? What could have made that regular experience a set-apart special experience, especially for the person who got blamed? If the person who actually did it would have gone up and told the teacher that they were the one who did it. That would have been unique. That would have been unusual. That would have been something special and something different, wouldn't it? So here's what I want you to do. Everybody, kids, put on your God goggles. And what I want you to do is when we leave this place, which is surrounded with all kinds of reminders of special and holy things, because this is a special and holy place, but we're called to be God's people in the world, to take that little piece of ground that's ours and make it holy ground. So I want you to think, massage your brains, about what you can do in your regular ground world to do something special, something set apart, something that no one's ever thought of to make someone else feel better, to make the earth feel better, to make God feel better, to make your little piece holy ground. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for this world. You're everywhere. And even though not every place is holy ground because of your love, and our love, every place can be holy ground. May it be so. Amen. Thank you. Good job. Why don't we make holy ground out of the space around us and extend the peace of Christ to the people in our midst?
be seated. So wonderful to see you all this morning and to be back in, in worship with you after having gone with uh, many of the members of uh, Coral Union to Ireland the last couple of weeks, along with two other churches from Deer Park, uh, Texas, and from Amarillo, who came together to form the Texas Methodist Chorale for the purpose of touring uh, Ireland. And we had a, we had a wonderful trip, and it's good to be back, uh, be back with you this morning. I was thinking about this, this business of holy ground, and I noticed something. I noticed that people of Irish descent who were on the trip, when they stepped from the airplane onto the ground at, in Dublin, it was as though they were stepping on holy ground, especially those who were there for the first time. And throughout the whole trip, there was this sense of, of being in a place that's different from any other place, and it was for them kind of like holy ground. My wife Susan is uh, Irish. Uh, her, her grandmother was 13 years old when she immigrated from Ireland, and uh, so she always had that sense the whole time we were there of there's something special about this place. And there were several places that were really seemed to be special to people, places where we sang and where we were able to be in beautiful cathedrals. Uh, and, and one place that still sort of puzzles me, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't quite wrapped my mind around this place, but a number of us, I think most people in the group, we, we climbed 127 steps to the top of a castle to kiss a rock. <laughs> and some people waited in line an hour to do that. The Blarney Stone. The stone of eloquence, it's also called. The idea is, if you kiss this stone, you'll be given the gift of eloquence. And I need all the help I can get, so I climbed 127 steps, kissed the Bar Blarney Stone, really not expecting the gift of eloquence so much as just hoping I didn't pick up some other gift <laughs> from having kissed the stone behind all those other people who had kissed it before. But there was something about that place that made people stand in line all that time. There's something different, something special with tradition and history and all of that. And when we think of holy ground, we tend to think of that. We, the holy land, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a place far away that's different from any other place. Or a sanctuary like this, that's where holy ground is. But the question is, where do we find holy ground these days, and what do we mean when we even talk about holy ground? Mr. Mark has given us some good insights into that. I want to talk about it also. The story of Moses is one we heard a moment ago where Moses encounters holy ground when he's going about his business keeping the flocks and he sees the burning bush and he hears the voice and he takes off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. That phrase holy ground is only found twice in Scripture, once here in this story and then in the book of Acts where the story is retold by Stephen. And so it's the same story, only two places we find that phrase holy ground. But holy ground is something that people in the Scripture encounter over and over and over again. And it's something that you and I encounter over and over and over again as well. So what is it? And where do we find holy ground? Well, holy ground is where we encounter God. The word holy does mean different, set apart for a special purpose. Special. But it also has that connotation of being special because of the divine presence of God being there. Uh, it has that connotation of being different or special because that's where we encounter God. Holy ground is whenever and wherever we encounter God and that we go a little bit deeper, take the trouble to walk over to that place or to think more deeply about God and to stop long enough to experience God. That's holy ground. Or we stop long enough to experience God. When God says, take off your shoes, Moses, you're on holy ground, I've wondered if it's because God wanted Moses to stay there long enough to have this conversation, to have this experience, rather than to run away. Take off your shoes. Be grounded in this place. Stay for a while and go deeper. 
Holy ground is where we experience God. And, and holy ground can come in a lot of different ways and, and often surprise us as that burning bush did for, for Moses. Often through the years, I've talked to couples who've had their first child and it was holy ground. They experienced God in a new and different way, in a deeper way. They experienced God's call on their lives to this new task of, of helping to form and to shape the life of this, this little baby that's now their responsibility. And, and in a way that they had never experienced God before, they experienced God. Or someone who's approaching graduation from high school and thinking about the future and thinking about what is to come and and suddenly they find that they are thinking very deeply about ultimate things and what their life is going to be like and what really matters and they find that they're standing on holy ground in this deeper experience of God holy ground can come in a lot of different forms in a lot of different places even in a time of illness I've shared with you before that one of the most profound periods of spiritual growth for me in my life happened in my early 30s when I had my first neck surgery and I was laid up for a while, unable to go about the normal routine and the busyness of life. And that's happened a few times in my life, but it was that time for some reason, the first time in my life that I experienced that and it became for me holy ground in a way that I really have a hard time even expressing to you, but I experienced God and I thought about very important ultimate things in ways that I had not really before. It can come in, in those ways, a, a mission trip or, or a spiritual retreat. All of those are, are places where we experience God more deeply in a service of worship as this morning holy ground. It's where we experience God and where we stay with that long enough to really have an opportunity to not only experience the presence of God as a feeling, but to think deeply through who God is and who we are and who we are in relationship with God. And so holy ground is that place also where we receive our call, our vocation, or we receive along the way a call from God of a particular thing we ought to be doing, a particular person that we ought to reach out to, someone that, with whom we should reconcile, uh, someone to whom we should re ex uh, extend forgiveness. God's call comes to us in many ways, but holy ground is that place where we experience that call of God on our lives. And sometimes it is to serve in a new way, to give in a new way, uh, to reach out in some new way, to speak in a way we haven't spoken before, or to write that letter that we need to write. God's call comes in many different ways, and that's holy ground. But it's also holy ground when we argue with God and we wrestle with God. And most of the passage of Scripture we heard and then the words beyond this passage has to do with Moses arguing with God. Moses doesn't feel qualified. He's concerned about going back to Egypt, the place where he has had to flee because he, in anger, killed an Egyptian taskmaster who was mistreating a Hebrew slave. And he's afraid, you can imagine. He feels unprepared. He doesn't know what uh, he will do when he gets there. He doesn't speak well. He does not have the gift of eloquence, and he argues with God about that. Over and over again throughout this long passage in the third chapter of Exodus, Moses is arguing with God, and that is holy ground. When you're at a place where you're pushing back and you're wrestling with God and, and, and you're wrestling with that call, that is holy ground. When you're wrestling with what you believe and what you understand about God and, and how you live that out in your life, you're on holy ground. And that's what Moses was doing. You know, it's, it's Parker Palmer who says that, that the beginning of discerning our call is listening to our own life. And I would put it this way. I would say we listen to our own life as God is 
created us to be and, and with the gifts that God has given us. We begin in that place, but it's Frederick Beekner that says that our deep need, I mean, our deep uh, uh, bliss, our deep gladness, and the world's deep need, where those intersect, that's where our call is. And that's holy ground when we come to realize that call. And it's that arguing and pushing back and wrestling that is holy ground too. And out of that, we come through it with, 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 having, some learn, with having learned some things. We learn that we're not alone. Moses learns that. We learn a lot about God. I am who I am, God says to Moses. I will be who I will be. You can also translate it. I will be with you. You can translate it as well. We learn about the faithfulness of God and the persistence of the call in our lives when God is calling us. And we learn that God gives us what we need to be who God calls us to be and gives us what we need to do who God, what God calls us to do. Someone has said that God doesn't just call the equipped. God equips the called. God gives us what we need. And at the end of all this arguing, in fact, in the midst of it, in the rest of this chapter of Exodus, God is responding to all of Moses' concerns with helping him see how he will be equipped to do what God is calling him to do. And that's holy ground. But where do we find holy ground? We really find it in the ordinary places. We don't have to travel a thousand miles to find holy ground someplace else. We can find holy ground as we go about our business as we go about doing what we do every day, as we practice the disciplines of our faith that, yeah, we don't always feel like doing that. We don't always feel like getting up uh, and coming to worship necessarily, do we? But it's that discipline and that regular doing of what we do. It's in those places in the midst of that that we find holy ground. Because the fact is, as Mr. Mark said, holy ground can be anywhere. It can be anywhere, because God is everywhere. But it's wherever we experience God, it's wherever we hear the call and we argue with God and we respond, that is holy ground. Peter Mayer has a wonderful song in which he talks about how he assumed as a child that holy, holy things, holiness was found only in very rare instances and only in church, but, but he sings in that song that everything for him is, is holy. What's he saying? Holy ground can be found everywhere. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, uh, the 19th century poet, said, Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush is a fire with God, and he who sees, only he who sees, takes off his shoes everywhere can be holy ground. And then holy ground is, is often the place of new beginnings. It's that, it's that time when you realize that whatever has happened in the past, the grace and the love of God in Christ, that grace extended to us enables us to put that behind us where we need to put it behind us, to learn from it, and then to move forward with a new beginning. Elie Wiesel, the great Holocaust, Holocaust survivor and tireless advocate for peace and justice, said that in the Jewish tradition, there is the understanding that God has given humanity a secret secret gift. And he said it's not the gift of beginning because it's God who begins. In the beginning, God. It's God who begins. But he said the secret gift that we possess is the gift to begin again. To begin again. And that place where we recognize that gift and we start over into a new phase of our lives, start over leaving something behind us, getting past a grudge, whatever it is, those new beginning places, that's holy ground. And we have the gift 
and the ability to begin again. And that was true for Moses. At the age of 80, he begins a new adventure, a new phase of his life altogether. It is never too late, this story reminds us, to begin anew. My prayer for you and for me as we go from this place is we would go with eyes wide open, with ears open to, to see and to hear those places that are holy ground for us, that we would stop long enough to pay attention and to experience God, that we would listen for the places where our giftedness and our bliss intersect with the world's needs and that we would answer that call argue as we might need to, push back as we probably should, but ultimately to know that God gives us what we need to be God's people in the world. Let's go from this place looking for holy ground. Amen. God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, we approach you in this time of prayer today recognizing that this too is holy ground. And we approach you today as we have before with a bit of uncertainty and insecurity. We have this sense that you have made a mistake, that you couldn't possibly use us, that we don't have the gifts or skills or experience needed to serve you as you are calling us to serve. You see us mumbling excuses about responsibilities and commitments and busyness. But we stand here on this holy ground corrected. Corrected as Moses was. We recognize that you know better than us. That you will provide what we need for the task to which you are calling us. That you have not made a mistake when aligning our hearts with a purpose or a calling. So today we call upon you to fill us up. Equip us with the compassion to extend love into the darkest corners of our world, our community, and even our family. Send us into the world to be bearers of hope and peace. God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you are also God of each of our lives. So send us out to recognize the holy ground before us, holy ground where your children are hurting, where your people need light, where you can use us to bring healing and hope. Send us to see holy ground also where love is thriving and peace is growing and hope is multiplying. And let us pray now together the prayer your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. come forward, we call upon God to bless our generosity that these gifts may be multiplied and used for the growth of the kingdom and for the expansion of holy ground.
doors of this church are always open. We gather of people of all ages and different abilities and backgrounds and perspectives, but we all gather together for one reason, and that's because we are on a journey of faith together, and we make a commitment together. So if you'd like to this to be your church home, I invite you to please come forward during the closing hymn. I'm so pleased to welcome into the membership of our church, Brandon McCready. And standing here with Brandon is Darcy Dupree, who grew up in this church, been in the church all of her life. And they, two weeks from yesterday, they will be married here in the sanctuary. And so that'll be a great celebration. And Brandon, we welcome you as you become a part of this church. And I ask you, do you reaffirm your faith in Christ? And will you be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? I will. Yeah, welcome thank again. And Darcy, good to have you standing well, you. up thank here you. with Brendan. And look forward to, in less than two weeks, you'll be standing up here again. Yeah, it'll be wonderful. All right. And uh, Randy Brooks is part of our First Friends program. And as Randy told you a moment ago, he will uh, uh, be available to help you find a place of ministry and Christian growth and service here among us. I'm going to ask them to remain down front so that you can come and give them a warm First Church welcome and your congratulations uh, as well at the close of the service. Now, after, uh, after we sing our closing song, if you'd like to be seated to hear the, uh, the postlude uh, that our quartet will be playing, you are certainly welcome uh, to do that. Uh, and thank you again for your beautiful music this morning. It has been a real blessing uh, to us. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.